Okay, let's start. It's 2 p.m. Welcome back, everybody, to the Escape School. This afternoon, we still have uh, Tom uh, presenting Panda and Matt Pultim, and we'll start with Panda right away. Can go ahead. All right, thanks. So, welcome to this uh, Panda's introduction. Um, I will do the same as uh, in the in the um, NumPy session. So let me open a new fresh live session um, notebook so that uh, oh I forgot to upload the live session from the NumPy uh, session. So I will do this afterwards. And uh, yeah, let's uh, copy these cells over just to. By the way, you can copy cells by hitting C and V. It's quite cool. Uh, so I just select it. You see this blue bar when it's selected. I hit just the C button on my keyboard, and here I can press V to paste it. And uh, so my two cells, C for copy and V for paste. And uh, then I can hide all the stuff and make it a bit bigger. All right. So this is the introduction to Pandas. Um, as usual, I would start uh, with the versions I use for future reference and also to check whatever you use. So most of the things will work with uh, some recent versions of Pandas and NumPy, so you don't need any fancy things. Uh, of course, the best is uh, you use the Conda environment we uh, created for you. Um, that makes sure that you use the exact same versions, but it, it's anyways a basic introduction, so all concepts should apply. Uh, here's my um, magic again, which I uh, did not manage to use. Uh, Martin Schneider pointed out that I forgot an art. This is why it's not, not recognized, so it was working. I used this uh, small um, magic to shorten the long back traces when, uh, sometimes when I when I do some errors, so yeah, just just ignore it for now. Okay, uh, let's uh, uh, open a fresh new notebook on your um, computer. If you did a git pull uh, and updated your repository, you should see at least um, this introduction to pandas, where you can, if you want to catch up, you should see all the stuff we will explore today and these exercises, which only contain the exercises. So if whenever you are bored or uh, you want to do something else, you can just open these and, and try to um, solve them. Uh, the solutions I will not show now, I will put them later on. Um, hopefully this time we will finish the whole lecture. <laughs> In case of NumPy, I, I took a bit longer than expected, way longer. So with your fresh notebook, um, import pandas as PD, this is the the general uh, convention to import pandas. And we will try, uh, dive in right away, just like in, in NumPy, and explore the most important thing. So as you remember, in NumPy, it was the multidimensional array, the ND array. Uh, and in uh, pandas, it's, it's uh, more or less the data frame, which we are working on. Um, so let's uh, generate some dumb data. This is just a Python list containing a few numbers. and uh, in pandas, you create a data frame with this uh, with this class, and you most of the time you can just uh, paste in some data, and it will create a data frame for you. And uh, you can already see that um, um, Jupyter notebooks uh, understand these data frames because these provide some nice HTML output um, use, using these magics, and the um, Jupyter notebook will uh, correctly show these uh, HTML layouts. So it's really nice to work with data. Uh, this way with tabular data, of course. Um, and uh, you have this uh, tabular representation, as I already saw you have also some highlights to, to navigate through if you have really big data, it, it's uh, uh, very useful. Uh, but now let's generate some more interesting data. So I will now create a dictionary, uh, a Python dictionary, which is also a very nice way to create some dummy data to work with. Um, I add one entry with the key A and uh, I just put in some numbers. Um, then another entry with the key B. Um, here I use some floats, um, something you can think of. You just have to keep in mind that this is tabular data, so the uh, rect and uh, other eject structures are, are not so easy to handle. So I always keep the same number of elements, um, like 
this again three of them um, and actually there is an exception if you only provide one element like here in this case now it's not an array it's just a single value um, pandas will assume that you want to have the same um, element uh, for each of the of the entries in it so it's easy to initialize a whole column to a default value like zero or in this case uh, 42. So now we have only this Python dictionary. So uh, let's pass it to a data frame. And uh, in this case, um, I will also save it, uh, also assign it to a variable named df. It's quite fun, common for data frame. So when I put in this data into the constructor and uh, just type df to um, look what we get, you can see that indeed we created this table, this, this data frame, which is show the state and uh, show the stable and you have these column names which is currently a b c and d these correspond to our keys which we put in here and the values are uh, these uh, arrays uh, following you also have this uh, index column this is how it's called and these are named indices for each row so this way you can identify each column by uh, by name by unique name um, let's uh, look at the type of df uh, as I told you, it's uh, it's a data frame. This is this class is living here in the pandas core, um, and this data frame actually can be accessed uh, like a dictionary, like before. So I can access a single row uh, by just uh, typing df and then this square brackets like in dictionaries, and just the name of the row, and uh, you get back something which already has a d type. So you um, recognize this from from numpy. Um, this means that uh, so in this case here you see the, the indices, this is this index column, and these are the values, and it has a predefined D type, so this already um, tells you that this is an umpire array behind the scenes, or uh, doesn't tell you, but I can tell you that it is one, so it's, it's, uh, it, it can work efficiently with the different kind of algorithms which use um, contiguous uh, array data in memory. Um, if, you, if you look at the type of this, what we got back now, um, it's uh, not an umpire array, um, but it's wrapped into a, um, a structure called series or into a class uh, called series. Um, this is because it has some other options like this index stuff, etc. So behind the scenes, it's an umpire array, but it's uh, it's wrapped for you for, to have some nice convenient um, things. Um, the cool thing is uh, it behaves like an umpire array, so you can things like. Uh, you can do things like like this. Um, it does the same as with numpy arrays. So if you multiply it by a number, it multiplies every single element by that number. And uh, yeah, but you always get back a series. So this is the, um, the main difference, basically. Uh, numpy also understands these. So you can uh, pass in um, a series, which is basically a part of this data frame, into a numpy uh, ufunc, and uh, it will figure out that it's uh, it's a um, numpy array uh, behind the scenes and uh, do the right stuff. Um, all right, so let's uh, create a series from some random integers um, like, like this. And uh, before we do this, we initialize our random number generator, which uh, I also put it here, I hope so. Yes, there is it, so this line, uh, I have not shown it to you before, but uh, now I you can, copy, uh, you can uh, type it down. So RNG equals NP random default random number, number generator. Some people ask uh, ask uh, why to do this and not use the module directory or why not uh, setting the, the global seed via one function call. Um, it's important that you use your own stuff uh, because if you set if you mess around with global state, uh, you never know if someone else maybe also messes around with the global state. So if you're using lots of libraries and some other libraries behind the scenes reset the seed, uh, then your numbers uh, from this random from your random num number generator are not determinist deterministic anymore. So in this case, we own this object, we set the seed to 42. So from this uh, moment on, all calls to this RNG in sequence will result uh, in, with the same values. So this is the reason why you should do this. Okay, so let's uh, create the series like this. So this is how I, uh, our series look like. And um, there are some nice utility functions. Um, 
um, in pandas, which uh, you can use to work with this stuff, of course, uh, something like sort values. If I call this, this will sort, sort my values. But as you noticed, um, the, the indices are um, also kept um, in place with the values themselves. So this remembers uh, which index belongs to which value, which is very, very important if you want to want to correlate data with each other. So now you sorted them, but it's basically more or less uh, visually sorted. Uh, behind the scenes, the data are still correlated to their indices. And this um, is sometimes something which uh, people mess, uh, mess up. If you, for example, want to do something like uh, this S uh, array, which looks like this, as we have seen above, and then multiply it with the sorted uh, values, um, then you will notice that uh, this actually is something like a square uh, function because whenever you do some multiplications, uh, pandas will make sure that it will match the indices. So it will really either, uh, so, so uh, the sort values are mi uh, mixed up, but it will still make sure that it will multiply the element with index uh, zero with the element of index zero in the other array. So this is why you get this, uh, this weird behavior. Um, what you can do, um, because sometimes you want to um, uh, sort your values or mix them up uh, and uh, also want to reset the index, then, as I just said, um, you can um, use this uh, reset index and let's uh, drop the other one. So in this case, I sorted them and I reset the index and those are now um, really not corresponding to the same uh, index value pairs from before. So when I do something like S times with this, then you see that I get different numbers. Those are not anymore corresponding to this squaring behavior because it doesn't match the, um, the indices anymore. Okay, so this to keep in mind, you will use this reset index uh, uh, quite often. This drop is just to get rid of the old index. Otherwise, uh, to still stay there. Okay, let's go back to our data frame. So in case um, you don't have this data frame because you just joined, uh, I created this data frame from this dictionary, but uh, you can create whatever you want and the examples will work. Um, so this is a Python dictionary. I pass it again to my um, constructor, which is this data frame. This. Now I get back this uh, table. And I wanted to show you the D types. Uh, I already told you that uh, these are NumPy arrays behind the scenes. And the D types attribute, notice the S uh, in contrast to NumPy D type, uh, when you look at uh, a single array, this will give you um, a list of, um, of things which are inside this uh, data frame. So the column A has a D type of in 64, column B uh, float 64, and column C is an object, uh, thing. So these are actually Python objects which are living here. This means that this column contains pointers to these objects uh, wherever they live in memory. And uh, these again in 64. And uh, you can also have a look at the columns, which is often useful if you want to have a quick look at what you, what you have loaded. Um, this gives you all the column names. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> and similar to NumPy arrays, um, data frames also have a shape. So in this case, the shape is uh, three times four because we have three rows and four columns. Now let's have a look at the data with some utility functions. The first one is head. Head is a really useful function to, if you have a very large um, table, you can just have a look at the first few entries. In this case, it doesn't make much difference because our um, table is already quite short but you can provide a number. So the default value is five. As you can see here, if I put in a two, it will only show the first two um, entries uh, and similar to, to head, um, there's tail. So these are coming from Unix. There are also these Unix commands where you can inspect the first few lines or the last few lines of a file. And uh, yeah, this will give you the first or the uh, first two or the last two um, entries of the, of the data frame. Another function which is very useful if you just opened your data set and want to have um, a quick look um, at how it looks like or what, it, what it's inside is uh, the describe um, uh, method. 
Um, this will show you some basic statistics about your data. It will show the count, so how many entries do you have, what's the mean value, and standard deviations, min max, and the, the quantize. Um, so this can be useful to, to have a, a rough feeling uh, uh, about what, what you are dealing with. Okay, slicing. Um, let me write it down. No, come to slicing. Slicing is, is a bit different um, compared to NumPy, but only a little bit. Um, because you usually do not directly slice something um, like a data frame. So here you can see it, uh, it gives you a key error. Oh, now I can show you this short error, which will not work. Uh, it gives you a key error, error. it uh, doesn't find this three in the data frame. So what you do is uh, you either have to use the lock or the iLock um, things, um, helpers, um, to do this. And um, yeah, there is a there's a different in between those. So let me just write them here down for reference, and uh, let's see what what lock does. So if I this is my data uh, frame, if I now use lock and then square brackets, so this is not a function; it's really um, a Python magic in this case, uh, or an object which uh, implemented get item. Um, I can type in some value, and in this case, I choose uh, two, and this two corresponds to to this one. Uh, so in this case, I retrieve this uh, this row, and there and uh, there is a very uh, important difference between lock and iLock, which you will see very recently. So as you know, in Python, you can, for example, access the last element with minus one, but if I two a minus one uh, in it, then uh, it will give me an error, namely it doesn't find um, the minus one, and this key error already hints that this is some kind of a dictionary which is uh, which is uh, working behind the scenes. And in case it really is, because uh, these things are now uh, interpreted as uh, real values. So uh, it's just a coincidence that the, that these uh, values are now sorted numerically, but this could be also one, zero, and two, etc. So there is no order inside. You could also name um, rows with the strings. So it could be A, B, and C, or whatever you, you choose. And then you would do something like log and then A or so. Uh, for now, like this. So if you really want to have the second row or so, then you have to use uh, the iLock method, which I will show you later. Um, oh, let's, let's show it now. We can skip this uh, section. OK, so iLock, um, df, iLock, uh, also with square brackets. So if I pick now two, I get this very same result because, uh, as I said, this is the the same enumeration, so this is by coincidence. This really now takes the index uh, of at position two, which is the third third row. Uh, but as you can see here, the minus one also works, and the minus two should get the second last element, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here you can use numbers. Um, yeah, if you put in something which is not um, present, then you don't get an index error, uh, um, a key error, uh, but an index error. Um, it tells you that uh, you are out of bounds because there are not that many elements. Okay, so this is how to access single um, rows. And of course, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, magic uh, can work here for slicing. Um, our data frame is now quite um, tiny, but uh, I can select here one, two, three, which uh, would select the second and the third element uh, without um, the last one. Uh, yeah, so. This is how it works. All right. Now let's uh, um, try some more interesting stuff uh, where pandas really shines. Uh, grouped operations. Okay. Now I have to cheat a bit and uh, copy over uh, a bit larger data set. Feel free to just uh, write your own one. Um, I explain a little bit what this is. So um, I create a data frame again from a dictionary, and this dictionary has uh, four keys and uh, the one key is the location, which contains some, some countries, in this case, Italy and France, and some of our ARCA detectors and ORCA detectors, uh, even, even Nemo and Antares is here, I just realized. Um, and um, then some random numbers for X and Y positions, a really dumb one. But uh, if I create this, um, now we have a bit larger data set. Uh, you can see that this is now a list of detectors. They have a location, a detector ID, and uh, X and Y positions. 
And uh, now we would like to, to do some uh, grouped operation on them. Uh, what do I mean by it? Uh, you can um, group um, these, uh, this data by a given column. For example, I can call df group by, I leave it there so that you can, in case you want to type it down, uh, can look at it. So I can call uh, df group by and then just provide a column name, for example, location. And uh, this will create a group by um, uh, object, a data frame group by object. Um, let's uh, store this. Um, df by location, like this. And uh, there are some methods which you can use to, uh, to have a look at, at the groups, for example. Uh, this will tell you, okay, uh, there are the groups France and Italy. So it uh, found these four, uh, two times four, four entries. And uh, these correspond to the indices um, of, the, of the rows. So this is the I location. Um, actually, it's, it's, it's the index location, sorry. And to get a group, um, you can use DF by locations, uh, get group, just as I said. France, for example. And this will give you only the data set which contains um, the detectors in, in France. Here you can see that the, here is the, the index location one, four, six, and seven, just as you have seen here. And this is now a subset of the data. So if you want to have a look at the X, um, um, oh, maybe I do a new line, sorry. If you want to have a look at the X location, then you can access this uh, like this. Um, okay, let's do another grouping. Um, I will now create an, another data frame, which contains just a few numbers. Um, here I have some event IDs and some hit times and uh, photo multiplier IDs. Um, this is quite a, um, a usual structure in uh, our experiment where we uh, record events, which consists of hits. And uh, one way to store um, events uh, in this uh, uh, rectangular structure is to store an event ID and uh, in one uh, column and then the hit times and the PMT IDs um, in separate columns. So whenever you want to have a look at event ID one, you have to grab the first three because those are corresponding to event ID one and event ID two only contains two elements, etc. This is by the way, also the trick uh, awkward array uses and other um, or similar uh, trick uh, like awkward array uses. You can also use an index array where you say that the first uh, event uh, starts at index uh, X and contains an elements, et cetera, et cetera. But for the sake of simplicity, I choose this method to group them. So let's have a look at this. This is now our table. And uh, I can now group by event ID. So um, DF group by event ID. Now I have my hits per group ID, so to say. And it's quite common to iterate over it. So usually you want to do some iterations or some aggregations, which I will show you later. Um, so let's uh, call it event ID and then hits um, in, oops, sorry, DF group ID. And let's uh, print the event ID and also print the hits. So this is the result. We have three events. The first event has the event ID one, and this is the table which is printed. Oh, let me add another new <laughs> line artificially. Uh, it's a bit more um, visible then. Okay, so this is event ID one, and this is my subtable, and this is my second subtable with only two hits, and my third subtable with four hits. Um, Okay, and now maybe we want to analyze uh, the hits per event. So I want to do some operations, but not on the whole data set, but on, on chunks of data sets. Uh, I mean, still on the whole data set, but not on a, on a single row, but in a, in a grouped row. And this is where this group by is really um, interesting. So I do the same um, group by event ID, and then uh, I pick the hit time, and I call an aggregation function, which is in this case min. So what now happens is uh, Pandas um, takes this data frame and groups it by event ID. 
So it looks uh, which event IDs are similar and, co and construct these tables as I sh uh, showed to you. Then it looks at the heat times entry. So in, uh, at these uh, columns here, um, and uh, then it calls the min function on this data set. So the first one um, uh, will return 13. This is here, our first entry. The second one will return 23 because this is the minimum of this array. And the last one is, uh, is the one which will give you this one. Um, and there are, of course, um, other uh, functions. Um, let me just copy paste it boldly. I can use, of course, max. Or so I can also call something like uh, sum or so, which doesn't make much sense in the, in the hit time, but maybe the total. Um, oh, I don't have dots here, I'm sorry. OK, let's uh, sum up the hit time. Um, but sometimes you also want to use your own functions or some other functions. So there is a universal method which you can call, which is called aggregate. And to this aggregate, you can pass in for example, a string. So in this case, this is completely equivalent to just calling this uh, min above. Um, it's just a, basically a syntactic sugar. Actually, there is a little bit of difference because this will call a, an optimized version. Here, it's not guaranteed. So there, you definitely know that it's a, it's a guaranteed uh, optimized version. Here, you might have one uh, or not. Um, and here, um, you can even pass um, a full set of functions. So I can now also use the numpy min, um, <coughs> sorry, the numpy min function, or the median function either, and the, the built-in sum function and the built-in min max functions, etc. So as you can see, um, this operation um, works uh, um, the same way. So it groups, it, it splits up into into the event IDs, then looks at date time and aggregates and creates all these things. Um, yeah, so this is very, very useful when you do uh, operations on, on aggregated um, group, groups of data. Um, you can even do um, groups uh, by multiple levels. So you can, if you have uh, data where you have, for example, countries and cities, um, then uh, you can group by country and city at the same time, and then you have nested uh, groups inside. Uh, this I will show you later. All right. Um, let's look at transformations. Um, these are also uh, very important. Um, so let's generate some data. Um, let's see, let's set n to 1000 and uh, we generate an index of, uh, of date ranges. Uh, there is this date range method of pandas. This is really useful if you want to create some, some random dates. So let's take the date to this. To is this the date today? Yes, it yeah. doesn't really matter. Um, periods, we want n periods, and the frequency should be one day. So um, I'll show you what it created right now. So now you have this date time index um, uh, object, which is returned. It contains 1,000 elements, and the frequency is day. So it starts from this, uh, from this date and adds uh, these uh, date time 64 ns. Uh, D-type um, objects into this array with a frequency of one day. Okay, let's uh, create a time series um, out of it. So a panda series. Um, we can um, generate, for example, a normal distribution with the parameters 0 0.5 and 2 and 1,000 of them with this given index. So. Sorry if it was a bit too fast, but uh, now you can see that I have this series, which is basically a NumPy array, so a single column uh, represented as, uh, as a uh, Spanda series. And uh, this now contains um, some kind of a random value for each day uh, in this uh, time index period, so in these thousand days. So we have one uh, random value uh, for each day. and. Uh, Quite common is, uh, is a so-called rolling uh, window uh, analysis. Um, I'm sure you have heard about this. You can do this uh, directly um, here with the series. Uh, oh, rolling, sorry. <laughs> it's uh, hard to talk and write at the same time. So I define a window of uh, 100, for example, and the minimum periods to take into account um, should be also 100. Um, so this will 
create this rolling window. And I can, for example, now call this uh, mean aggregation. So what this uh, now does is uh, it takes uh, 100, so it, it traverses through to my data set and takes uh, um, up to, so uh, um, with a window of 100 elements and calculates the mean value of it. And it requires a mean um, a minimum uh, periods of 100 um, to calculate. Now you always receive a uh, none because uh, it's, it slides uh, into your, your data set and uh, then it, it doesn't, uh, uh, it, it cannot calculate the mean. So some values are not a number. This is what it, what it means. Uh, but uh, pandas gives you this nice feature to drop those if you're not interested in them. Um, so drop uh, not a number if you call it like this, then uh, your rolling time uh, time window uh, looks like this. So let's save this into, into the variable with the same name and print it again. Um, and uh, yeah, now we want to do some transformations. And uh, the first uh, transformation we, we should try here now is uh, to standardize the data within each group. So let's call it transform. And now we group. We do this group by, uh, and uh, for the group by, we now um, use a function which we can pass in. So in this case, uh, we can uh, choose the year um, to group by. So this function will basically uh, return always the year from this from this date time uh, thing. <coughs> Maybe I show it to you. Like this. Um, so I group by year. So this means that the key is a, is the year, and then all the data is uh, following uh, afterwards. Well, let me delete this. It's a bit too too large. And um, I can apply this transformation where I all, also take a anonymous function. This oh I forgot to mention this uh, lambda uh, lambda is just a function which you create ad hoc in line. So it's uh, it's just a function. I could also create this function with def, blah, 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 but it's it's a bit easier. So it's, it's very common uh, to use these uh, tiny throwaway functions um, in the stuff. OK, so let's uh, take uh, each value which is passed in and calculate the x minus the mean and divide it by the standard deviation. And this is now our transform, the data, uh, transform data. Um, so again, if I would do, um, maybe it was a bit too fast. Um, so the grouped version is uh, group by lambda x, uh, and I take the year. And if I look at the mean, then uh, you can see that this is how it, it basically looks like. So before I showed to you the whole data set, now I'm just aggregating the mean. So I group them by year, and I calculated the mean value. This is uh, yeah, roughly roughly equal in this case. Um, and uh, I can also check the standard deviation. So like this. OK, now, as uh, you can see here above, we standardized it. So now we should get a, a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. So let's uh, check our um, grouped uh, transformation. I call it group trans. Group to trans, so transformed. And uh, this is what we created above. We group it by the year again. And um, X year transformed. Sorry, I made some mistake above. Hmm. Group by, not group. Uh, so, like this. And let's look at the grouped transformations mean. Hopefully, we get zeros. Uh, yes, this is in the for a computer scientist. This is zero. <laughs> it's uh, e to the minus. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, ten to the minus sixteen. And uh, group trans standard deviation is one. So it's standardized now. Okay, maybe you still don't believe me. So let's uh, have a quick look at the data. How it looks like. And for this, uh, we can use uh, a really nice integration of plots, which I usually only recommend for, for playing around. Um, we can have a look at the original data, which was our TS, and the transform data. 
um, which was this transformed one. And uh, so this constructs a data frame with these two data frames. And uh, I can call simply plot at the very end. And uh, what it does is uh, it shows me my two data sets. And as you can see, this is our original data set and our transformed uh, data set. Um, all right. So let's go to plotting. Um, because I mentioned plotting. Let me generate a new data frame. DF, PD, data frame. So I pass in again a um, dictionary. Let's call it foo. And, uh, and there is this cumulative sum function, which is uh, quite nice in NumPy. Um, let's generate n numbers. Let's choose um, 1000 for n. Um, yeah, subtract something for it. Minus, oh, don't really need this. Okay, this is our foo. And since it's random, we just uh, copy paste it again and again. So we have three data sets. Uh, let's call this one bar and this one R, like this. Um, yeah, and that's, as you as you have seen it above, um, I can call the plot function on the data frame, and um, this will then uh, show this nice distribution. Uh, these 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 lines on there. Okay, it's not a spectacular plot, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, it shows the functionality you get. You can also um, use uh, other kinds of things. So this stuff is, uh, is uh, passed around to, uh, to Matplotlib. Um, so there, um, there's also a histogram and there are lots of options like I've already mentioned uh, in my last talk. Uh, you can hit uh, shift tab and uh, get a, get a help um, on, the, on the current function. Um, and um, actually this uh, plot method is the one which is which implements everything, but it's it's very very bloated. Uh, here you can, for example, pass in kind equals hist, and this is uh, basically the same as uh, calling di directly hist. Um, so I will not go into too much detail uh, right now because there are a lot of options which you can do here. Uh, most of the times, as I, as I already mentioned, it's better to to do this in in Matplotlib because I made the experience that this API changes a lot, and some plots are are then looking differently with the newer versions or not working at all. So it's better to rely on, on one API. But for exploratory work, it, it's perfectly fine. Um, OK, let's, uh, we are heading to the end of the warming up session. Um, so let's uh, have a look at some, some minor things. For example, um, the memory uh, usage of data frames, which uh, uh, might be very important. So most of the time, uh, when I get uh, when I when students are asking questions uh, or are having problems with pandas, it's the it's the memory usage of pandas, because they often load like a gigabyte of data sets or more and then blow their memory up by doing some transformations, etc. So it's always good to 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 look at the at the at the memory usage and get a feeling of uh, how much data uh, you have. So let me generate a. Our random generator. So again, if you are not, uh, if you have not followed from the beginning on, uh, this is our random number generator. Um, RNG equals MP random default with the seed forty two, uh, and now I generate uh, one. Oh, then let's let's do ten million numbers. You can do these underscores because it's uh, easier to recognize how many zeros are there. These are just completely ignored when uh, Python parses the number. Um, so here's our data, and now we do a data frame out of it. Uh, data frame, and we pass in the data. And in this case, I made it a shape with the 10 million uh, and six. And um, I made this because I wanted to have some nice um, column names, also not only one, two, three, four, five, but A, B, C, D, F. So this is how it looks like now. Um, this is our data. It's really huge. It has now 10 million rows and six columns. And uh, you can see if I just uh, print it or just uh, type it into, into a, a cell and hit uh, shift enter, 
it only displays the first five and the last uh, five elements, so it, it already is quite clever and doesn't spam your browser because it can it could crash. But uh, you can of course uh, also use the tail and head methods, which I showed you before, uh, like this. Okay, so let's have a look at the at the at the memory usage. Maybe you can try to guess it before I, I show it to you. Uh, Ten million entries, uh, six times. Um, this. Uh, Maybe you can guess if it's if it's a, a 10 megabytes or is it a gigabyte or is it 10 gigabytes? I can tell you that I only have 16 gigabytes of memory on this MacBook, so <laughs> it's uh, probably not too much because my machine is still working. Okay, so now I will go ahead and show it to you. Um, there's this optional memory usage deep, uh, which is a bit more accurate. Um, so you can see here um, we have these entries and six columns. The D types are also 64, so you can uh, basically you can already guess uh, quite uh, nicely what the size is. We have half gigabyte. Um, so you can imagine if I work with this data set and I do a copy of it, I already have one gigabyte. And um, if you do some inefficient calculations with this stuff and multiply them together, then these intermediate stuff also have to live somewhere. Uh, so this might blow up your memory uh, quite quickly. Okay, so this is one thing to keep in mind. Yesterday, I got a question whether we will cover some Excel tables uh, with pandas. Um, unfortunately, I had not uh, enough time to prepare some, some things, but what I tried and what worked quite nicely and what I also used before is uh, I opened up, uh, this is uh, numbers, so it's, it's not uh, Excel, uh, but it's basically the same. Um, um, and I created some, some dummy numbers uh, here and there. Uh, let's uh, put it like this. Um, and instead of saving it and uh, and loading it with pandas, I would I would uh, like to show you something else. Uh, I can just uh, um, copy uh, these cells, and even if it's uh, so, if it's it's numbers in this case, it's it's um, Apple application, so it has nothing to do with Excel or whatever. Uh, but uh, I can use the read um, clipboard function, um, which I indeed used a few times. Um, in pandas, and uh, this will now read your clipboard, so whatever is in your clipboard, so be careful if you have some passwords or whatever, <laughs> you do live presentations, uh, and construct a data frame out of it. And the data frame now looks exactly like the one you had in your in your table. So um, I usually do not work with Excel uh, data on, uh, on, on my computer, but sometimes I have to copy out something um, from the students, for example, <laughs> who uh, deliver uh, things like this. And uh, if I want to check something, it's, it's really nice because I can just uh, select the, the thing I want. If you want to read this with pandas, uh, it's a bit more complicated because you have to define which uh, sub table you are using because here you have sheets, etc. cetera. So uh, this can be a bit annoying. Uh, I did this uh, in the past a few times, uh, but uh, usually this clipboard method is, is, uh, is better. Um, yeah. Of course, if you want to have something which is reproducible and and which is uh, which needs to be um, integrated into some kind of workflows. Then don't use clipboards at all, and uh, that's that's for sure. <clears throat> all right. Another thing which is uh, very very helpful, um, especially also for machine learning um, or machine learning playarounds, is uh, subsampling. Um, so there are some some basic features in in uh, pandas to do some sampling. So let me again. Oh, I still have my data this large shape, right? Oh, it's not callable. Um, like this. <clears throat> so let me create um, a new, um, actually let me recreate the exact same thing just to make sure everyone is in line. I hope I'm not too fast and not too slow. Um, so again, this is our data frame. Let's look at the head. Um, contains a lot of random numbers. And uh, so now if I want to train my data or, or if I want to split it up for because I want to do some quick analysis and don't want to run on the full data set yet because it takes ages or whatever, um, you can create a subsample. Um, let's call it subsample. And this can be done with the sample method. And in the sample met method, you can define what kind of fraction you want to keep. Um, so in this case, I can say that I want to keep 10%. Uh, and you can even provide a random state, um, which is really nice because this makes it reproducible. Um, and the remaining uh, things are, and this is uh, uh, the nice feature, um, you can um, take the, the original uh, data frame, which is DF again, and then drop uh, everything 
everything which uh, um, has uh, the index of the subsamples. So you have to be uh, be careful a bit here to, I um, have to make sure that you understand this. Uh, this one is not modifying anything from the original data frame. So this is really just uh, doing the sampling and uh, it retrieves uh, basically um, um, something without uh, altering or modifying your, your original data. So that's why we can use it here in the second um, line either. So here we create a subsample. This will now point to this data. And the second one um, is uh, doing this uh, selection by selecting everything which has not uh, the index uh, of the subsample. So uh, this took like a second or so, if you have seen, because it's a lot of data, half a gigabyte. Um, subsample is now um, a randomly mixed up thing. As you can see, the indices are now um, messed up. And we have exactly um, uh, like this, you can see, we have exactly 10, uh, 1 million uh, times six columns. And our remaining should hopefully be the remaining 9 million rows, exactly. Okay, so um, I hope this uh, was uh, enough for a quick uh, introduction. Now the question is, uh, are there some urgent questions or should we uh, directly dive into the, into the exercises? Wait for some feedback. Yeah, sorry. I don't see very urgent questions, maybe some general ones like, um dealing with ios reading from files but maybe you will cover that in the exercises yes uh the reading uh, will be covered in the in the exercises so we go through the pain of reading csv files <laughs> perfect so i leave that for for them okay so you can continue all right so let's continue um okay uh so now if you want you can open the exercises uh uh, notebook or just follow with me along. Uh, these are very, very short things, uh, but of course you can always uh, talk hours uh, about the single method. Uh, I will try to do my best. So there are 15 exercises um, and um, they will uh, they will teach you uh, some, some basics of opening things and then doing these visualizations and, and uh, group buys. Um, okay, so uh, let's get back to my live session and now write. Um, exercises. So the first one is, uh, let's copy this over. Or actually, I, ah, let's copy this over. It's a live session. Uh, oh, this was the wrong one. Sorry. Okay. So I have a data set um, from our um, experiment and uh, it is located in uh, in data neutrinos csv um a very good thing is uh, before you touch uh, data is to is to have a quick look uh, especially if it's uh, if it's an ascii format um to just open it in some kind of editor or whatever the viewer um so we are in the pandas folder uh, oops i just ta -da. So this is the file we are looking at. <coughs> um, you can open it in any text editor. So if you navigate to your um, to your folder, I can show it to you here if you want to. Um, pandas data reco CSV on Mac. I can just hit uh, space. Uh, maybe it's a bit too large. I'm not sure. Oh, 10 megabytes. Yeah, there we go. It already buys it in a in a tabular data. So uh, this is how it looks like. Um, well, it's funny it figured out how to parse it. It's, I'm impressed because this is the pain we are now going through. <laughs> so it uh, quite nicely figured out how to parse it. Um, okay, so this uh, is provided by Moritz Lotz, a very good friend of mine. Um, I use this data set for demonstration purposes. I completely unformatted it uh, for teaching purposes. Um, Moritz would never hand out uh, such a mess. So. <laughs> Apologies, Moritz, uh, if uh, your name is now somehow um, confused with this mess, uh, but I make sure that people will not think about it. Um, as you can see, there are some comments at, uh, or some some text uh, at the beginning. Then there is this dollar sign, which is uh, which is used as uh, as comment. Then here, the, the values are separated by 
by this uh, column uh, um, characters, etc. So uh, maybe it will have a hard, hard time to interpret this data, but uh, we will have a look uh, as you saw already. Uh, my quick look on macOS uh, did a quite good job to read it. So uh, let's try it and then see what happens. So we can use this read uh, CSV um, uh, function to read the data set. And in this case, I can just uh, pass um, the path of the, of the file to it. And uh, yeah, we already see that there is a parser error. And uh, whenever you see a parser error, this means that it failed to parse. <laughs> Surprise. So it tries to um, to figure out what uh, what you what uh, columns you have or how the data is structured in and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, yeah, so you have here some weird message which tells you error tokenizing data. See error exacted three fields in line ten. So ten, blah blah blah. So most of the time this doesn't make much sense because the parser can parser errors can be really cryptic, and that's why I recommend to always open the data first uh, and uh, have a look. So here we already see. Um, that uh, that we should uh, skip the first few lines. Um, this is very common. Often you find some metadata, some provenance information in the file, which tells you where you have downloaded it or, or where it comes from. And one very, very good advice is do not mess around with raw data. So never, 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 ever open this data in an editor and delete these lines or, or do whatever. Always keep raw data as it is because uh, uh, you really want to do everything on the on the computational side if you want to uh, mangle it. There are tools to do this, and Pandas will, will help you. And this makes also sure that whenever a new data, for example, is uh, delivered to you or the data set is updated, this will probably contain the very same things again. So uh, you would have to open it again, delete things, then rename things, then replace characters, etc. So try to work with the format and uh, just adapt to it. This, uh, this is a very, very highly recommended. Okay. Um, skip the first lines. Um, so um, to skip uh, a few lines, um, we can do skip um, rows. And uh, let's have a look again at how many uh, there are. One, two, three, four, five. So let's skip five rows. This is then these first five. And let's see if it works. So we have again a parser error. Um, yeah, so it's still not working, um, but we already know that the convention, for example, is that the comment is usually hashtag, so that we can already put in, uh, let me format it a bit differently. Um, so I can say that the comment is a dollar sign, um, and uh, maybe uh, you already saw that the separator is not white space or, or space, uh, I mean space in, uh, white space in general, so not a space or tab or whatever, but it seems that someone used here columns to separate it. It's also visible here with the column names. So we can also specify this uh, by set equals um, like this. Uh, by the way, if you are still with your cursor in this uh, read CSV method, again, um, just hit uh, shift tab and you will find a lot of options which you can use. So if, uh, if you are, uh, for example, dealing with, with a file which uses uh, spaces and tabs uh, as uh, some mixed one, uh, you can use delim white space is equals true. So this will keep whatever white space it sees as a single separator um, and all the stuff. And everything is explained here. So if you scroll down, you will see all the explanations for all these options. So you, I'm usually always able to um, open whatever CSV file I, I get thrown at with this method. It's, uh, it's really nice and then powerful. Okay, so we have the separator. So let's try again. Oh, and uh, it seems um, it worked. So now we can work with our data, hopefully. Let's uh, see how it looks looks like. Uh, but I already see um, one weird thing. There is this unnamed thing, etc. And uh, the asymptot, etc., was also a bit uh, weird. Then the indexing is is double. So maybe we tell it uh, which one is the index column. We can do it right now. So we tell it that it has an index column, um, which is called index call equals zero. Let's try again. Now you can see that the index column is now not a separate column, but it's really the, this index, which is basically invisible for us. And there is this uh, line at the very end. So let's have a look at this. Uh, yeah, someone wrote end of line, end of file <laughs> into the file. So we don't want this either. So skip footer, is it called one? So we skip one line. And now you get a warning. Uh, it worked, but you get a warning. And the warning uh, now says, falling back to the Python engine because the C engine does not support skip footer. Um, this means that uh, 
there are different engines to parse this uh, CSV um, file. And the default engine is the C engine, which is very, very fast. Uh, however, this C engine uh, has a limited um, support uh, for, for these features. So in this case, Kip footer is not supported by, um, by the C engine. Um, so Pandas gives you a warning with, uh, okay, be careful. Um, I have to switch to Python mode, which, might, uh, which may be uh, slower. So actually I will not time it, but we can have a quick look at time. Um, time it macro just to see what the time difference is. Um, I can turn it into a, into a cell magic with um, two um, percentage uh, signs. So 400 milliseconds to use the Python engine. And we know that if we skip this, it should be faster. So it's twice as fast. So this might be very um, um, crucial if you have very, very large data sets. All right, so let's get rid of this time it again. Um, so this is our data set. Um, well, it uh, looks quite okay to me. Um, it's a bit weirdly formatted. And uh, the first thing you should always do whenever you read a data set from whatever sources, from your clipboard or from an Excel file or from an HD5 or, or whatever, well, from binary formats, you really not, but if you read it from, from text uh, formats, you should check the D types. Uh, this is important because the D-types will tell you if you are really working with efficient NumPy arrays uh, behind the scenes. And in this case, you can see that none of the uh, columns are efficient NumPy arrays. Everything is a Python object. So we basically now created uh, 60,000 times nine uh, Python objects in memory. So I, um, well, in this case, this uh, uh, memory info, okay. Um, skip this <laughs> right now, but uh, uh, the the memory consumption is now much much higher because uh, I think that uh, pandas won't even uh, figure it out correctly because there are many many pointers pointing all around uh, the memory. So what happened here? Why is it not working? And uh, sometimes you just have to, to to look further. And what I recognize is that it uh, that there is a comma instead of of a dot. So on my system, uh, it should uh, it should display a dot uh, as a decimal separator. So let's go back and um, find something with the decimator. Um, um, I hit again a shift top, which doesn't work right now. No, it works. Um, okay, let's look at decimal. And uh, if you scroll a bit around, you will find there is decimal, uh, which is uh, by default a dot. And uh, yeah, as I said, in our case, it's obviously um, a Come on. So let's try again. Ah, now it looks much better. Also, you can see that now the, the numbers are differently formatted. So without this decimal, uh, you already saw that uh, some values are short and some values are longer. This is because they were interpreted as strings. Uh, however, if you uh, have the correct decimal interpretation, then those are already floats and uh, those can be represented uh, uh, as floats, basically. So. Um, now check the D types again, and we are almost there. So it seems that uh, everything worked, but the Bjorken Y, the Bjorken Y is still an object. And uh, this is now uh, a bit annoying because uh, we don't know why uh, this happened. Um, so what we can now do, because here the limitations of, uh, of this uh, read CSV ends, uh, now we maybe have some corruption inside the, the file. Um, so we will have a look at this. Um, what we can do is uh, we try to force to convert um, the Bjorken Y to, to a float. So if, um, let me save this as neutrinos instead of DF. Uh, neutrinos equals neutrinos. OK. Neutrinos. So neutrinos uh, Bjorken Y. So this is our Bjorken Y, and uh, you can see this is an object uh, D-type. So um, there is this S-type function, which you already know from NumPy. And now I try with a float. And uh, yeah, indeed, it, it uh, cannot convert it to float because there is some error. And if we scroll down, I can show you the short error. Um, there is a value which could not be converted to to a float, and this is uh, this is, looks like this, and it seems that uh, that it has some problems because of this uh, minus maybe. So yeah, 
um, we can also check how many of these uh, lines are present there. So maybe it's only one, maybe it's it's multiple, maybe all of them, and we don't know. So we do a little trick here. So we check um, if this comma is uh, present for uh, B, for B and uh, neutrinos, uh, York and Y. And uh, yeah, indeed. So um, obviously two um, elements um, are containing still commas for whatever reason. So most of them, as you can see, are, uh, are parsed uh, correctly as floats, but there are two which are uh, printed like this. So something went wrong there. Um, now we can use some pandas features to localize these and then fix this issue by ourselves. Uh, Bjork and Y with comma mask. So we now create a mask. Um, and now we again um, look at the neutrinos, then Bjork and Y, y uh, like this. Um, and then at the string value of it, and here we can call contains uh, comma. So if I do this, um, I get back this mask, which uh, is now a Boolean mask, and somewhere there are two trues in it. Um, so if I apply this uh, mask, um, this is very similar to, to, Py, uh, to NumPy. Um, <laughs> I'm using the wrong mask again. This was the, the dumb mistake I made there and in the other one. Uh, then I can see, uh, I can select just those two elements. So this is how you work with, 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 uh, with data frames and, you, and masking. So these two are wrong. Um, so what can we do about it? Um, there is uh, another utility function which you can use. So if I call again the neutrinos data set and Bjork and Y and this uh, string operations, um, I can call replace uh, comma with dot. And if I do this, um, this will walk through all the entries in this Bjork and Y uh, column. Uh, call this string function replace and replace all the uh, commas to dots. So now we basically got rid of these two entries uh, with with their um, with their commas, and those uh, are replaced uh, to to dots. Um, but you also want to have now now we have a d-type object, so we want to convert it back to um, to floats. Let's type float like this. Okay. So this looks nice. Now we don't have any errors. And so what do, what do we do with that? But we can simply overwrite your, uh, our uh, York and Y uh, column with the new one, neutrinos. So that's it. We successfully read in our data set with a bit of uh, trouble, but it worked. So um, let's um, have a look at the D types again, just to make sure everything is fine. So everything was interpreted correctly. It's a very boring set. Only uh, float 64s, but uh, that should be nice. Okay, so exercise number two. Uh, so we, uh, sorry, exercise number two, uh, create a histogram of the neutrino energies. Okay, let's uh, have a look at this. Uh, this will be now very quick. So um, we already have seen how to make plots uh, with data frames. We will learn how to utilize uh, multiple for this. Um, so we have this neutrinos, um, energy, and histogram, and we just uh, call this with, for example, 100 pins. And uh, um, neutrinos, uh, yeah, pins, of course. There we go. Okay. Um, sometimes you don't want to have this extra output with, because this histogram uh, returns this excess subplot, uh, um, and you can suppress it by adding a semicolon afterwards. So I sometimes use it to to make uh, the output a bit more clearer. Not that you are confused. This is completely uh, optional, and uh, Python just ignores it, so there is no error. Um, okay, so this is our histogram, which is a, a nice energy distribution. Um, and uh, yeah, let's head over to the next exercise. Uh, the next one is, uh, oh, again, I read CSV. I promise you this will be not that catastrophic. Um, so exercise number three, Oops. Um, read CSV function to create a data frame from the data set reconstruction. So we have another data set called data and Rico uh, CSV. Let's read it in. Um, I call it Rico. Now I do uh, read CSV data. By the way, you can also use uh, uh, tab completion inside uh, parentheses. So if I now 
type DA and hit uh, tab, it will recognize that you are looking for a folder uh, or a file, and uh, you can then select your, your data set like this. So it's uh, also very handy. Um, I um, already know that the index column is zero, so um, I just make it a bit shorter. Uh, now it's read in, and uh, just to make sure that the D types are correct, um, always do this check. Um, so everything is fine, as I promised you. Nothing is broken here. We don't have to fix anything with this data. Okay, so now comes the funny part. Um, we want to, we have now a data set of neutrinos, which is basically our, our, our Monte Carlo truth, and uh, reconstruction, which is uh, our algorithm, which uh, does all this stuff. So one thing you would like to see usually is to, is to, is to compare uh, how well your reconstruction um, determines say, the energies or, or directions of, of these uh, reconstructed tracks in a neutrino detector. Um, so yeah, um, the first step is, for example, uh, we can combine those. Uh, we can use this concat function. Um, so we have this Reco data set, as you have seen. Uh, this has uh, column names like Senate, Azimut, Energy Muon, Energy Neutrino, Bjorken Y, etc. And the same is true for uh, neutrinos. Uh, these have uh, similar um, um, column names, but uh, yeah, at least there are some differences, but some of them are the same. For example, position X is also called position X and, and Zenit and Azimut are also called the same. So we have to take care about this if you if you combine them into a single data set. And what we can use is, is this concat method, as already pointed out. So concat takes a list of, of uh, um, data sets. So we can use, for example, neutrino and, uh, and Draco. And if I hit enter, it combine those. Um, but uh, um, there is a problem because uh, there are, um, as I just uh, showed you, um, columns which have the same name. So we have to rename those first before we combine them. And uh, Pandas gives you um, a function for this, um, which is um, attached as a method to the, to the data frames. And this is called add prefix. Uh, so if I call add prefix, uh, Reiko underscore, for example, let me show it to you um, in a cell above very quickly. Reiko and prefix, Reiko underscore. There you can see that it renamed now all the columns um, and um, added this uh, Reiko underscore prefix to it. So this way we know that these are coming from the reconstruction data set and they contain, uh, they don't, do not contain any more uh, similar um, column names. So this one is a data frame. This one is another data frame with prefixed uh, columns. And uh, yeah, just uh, to be sure that this is not changed in future as a default. Uh, I mean, the default is, I think, uh, columns, but I tend to put it always in. Uh, this will make sure that it's appended column-wise and not uh, um, somehow um, row-wise or so. Okay, so now we have combined these two data sets and uh, it took the index to correlate them. So it always looked, what is the, the um, 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 basically the, um, the ID, um, the track ID zero uh, in this data set and in this data set, and then it put it in, in a single uh, row. So now we can, for example, look at the Asimod and the Rico Asimod and compare those together. And hopefully those are uh, quite similar. Uh, we will see. Um, data, columns, um, or did I call, I, I did, I did not call them, but I assigned it, uh, them to a variable. So let's do it quickly. So data equals this concat. And uh, let's uh, print again the first few rows like this. So here are again the column names. Uh, you can see that we have all this stuff. So as I would it, you're by energy, et cetera, et cetera. And then all the appended, uh, appended stuff. Um, and the data, D type, so are still all floats. So we are all good. Okay, and uh, the next exercise is uh, make a scatter plot to visualize the, the Zenit reconstruction quality. Um, so this is what I told you, and what's uh, quite interesting usually, uh, you want to see um, how well um, things are reconstructed. Um, so we can use again the um, plot method and for example, use for X um, the, the Zenit and for Y, um, the Rico Zenit, like this. Uh, this will now take a bit. 
okay, this is not what we want because uh, the default plotting style is a line style. So um, we can uh, use a dot. Now it's a bit better, but there are many, many overlapping uh, um, dots. So you don't really see a density in this case. Um, what you can quickly do to fix it is, for example, do something like uh, um, alpha, um, regulate the alpha version or so. Um, let's uh, do this very quickly. So, um, plots. so this is now uh, the matplotlib part, which we will cover later. Um, so I created now a figure and an axis, and now I can use uh, the, the columns uh, explicitly. I pass them directly to NumPy, uh, to, sorry, <laughs> to matplotlib. Uh, and I use alpha equals zero, zero, 001. This is how it then looks like. So now you see a bit more density, but it's still not the way a scientist would visualize it. So uh, let's go to the right way. And the right way would be a 2D histogram in this case, uh, or at least one of the right ways. Um, again, we create um, plots and um, um, we call uh, a function called hist2d, which I will show you later. Edges in the image and this x hist2d. You can pass in again the data, zenith, and data recall, zenith, and we choose a number of bins like this. So this is now much nicer. Now you see the density, and you can also add the color bar to it, or um, let's add the color bar very quickly, like this. And then you can um, check the number of um, bin entries, increase the bin size, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Okay, this is what you what you would uh, uh, expect from a good reconstruction, or at least from a decent reconstruction. Okay, there are other things uh, which you can do um, with uh, with grouping and plotting, uh, which is uh, which is very helpful. Um, for example, exercise number six. Here, uh, we would like to create um, a histogram of the cascade probabilities. So, there in the Neutrino study set, you have. Um, a proper cascade column. And, uh, and the, the question is now how to create um, uh, different histograms for, for different energy ranges. So very often, if you open a data set, you want to have some plots or you, you want to do some, some histograms uh, on, uh, on the specific ranges which you, which you want to pick manually. And um, this is very easily done with pandas using the cut method. So first I define my, my bins. So I, I say that I want to have these energy bins from one to five, uh, five to 10 and 10 to 20 and uh, 20 to 100. And uh, then I create, uh, for example, uh, as a, I mean, this is, a very, uh, this is what, how I do it. Usually I add a new column um, to the data frame um, using uh, the PD cut, so I call this column Eben, which will then assign um, a value um, for each uh, entry in the in the, um, in the original file uh, to which bin it belongs to. So zero, one, two, or three. Um, so for this, I have to cut the data neutrinos um, dot energy into these Ebins, and uh, I don't want to have the labels, so I set it to false. Um, so this is now um, added. So if, if you look at our neutrinos, um, let's uh, that again. you can see that now we have this even column. Um, so the first one contain all zeros. Um, the last one are different. <laughs> Lucky me. Um, one, three, two, one, one. Um, so this will decide in which uh, in which uh, histogram they should uh, basically uh, belong to at the very end. And uh, now I can use the hist function again um, on the proper uh, um, probability cascade, sorry, like this. Uh, unfortunately, um, tab completion doesn't work here. <laughs> uh, by even, so I'm now telling um, pandas to create a histogram of the uh, probability cascades and uh, uh, group them by, by even. And uh, I can find the number of pins, like um, 50 or so. So, and there's an argument error because I again type pinch instead of bins, and uh, I put in my semicolon so that we don't get these. So, and uh, here's your very, very basic plot, which is not annotated. It's ugly as hell, but uh, 
uh, you can see that there are different distributions for different uh, energy bins. So this is the, the bin uh, for energies between 5 GeV, 5 and 10, 10 and 20, and 20 and 100 GeV. Okay, so I'm again a bit too slow, but I also have the feeling I'm a bit too fast. Um, I try to maybe skip one or two exercises so that you can discover on the, uh, them on the on your own. Um, yeah, maybe let, let's do a last one quickly. Or how much time do I have? I started at at, uh, at two o'clock, right? You still have fifteen minutes. <laughs> fifteen minutes. Okay. All right. So pandas exercises. Uh, let's do exercise number ten or. Ah, okay. No, let's uh, let's do something uh, something more interesting at the very end. Um, so I will skip to exercise. Um, oh dear, I was too slow. Uh, very interesting things with group by operations are now gone. Okay, we do this exercise with the reading uh, came three net uh, hit data. So there is a file. Um, let me quickly annotate. I think I can do it in 10 minutes. Um, so read a KM3 net uh, event file, which is in data hits.h5. So this is an h.h5 file. Um, there is a command. So in Jupyter Notebooks, not sure if you already know this. Um, I'm sure some of you don't know this. Uh, you can use the exclamation mark to launch uh, commands in the terminal. Um, so there's this PT dump, which is coming from PyTables, and uh, it can dump um, um, the contents of, a, of an HD5 file. So in this case, um, I just have a quick look at this H, uh, HD5 file to see what kind of groups are there. So as you can see, there is this hits group, and uh, you can ignore this stuff. This is uh, written by pandas um, because I exported these, uh, this data set with pandas. But there's this hits group, and uh, I can use the uh, pandas read htf 5 function to read this data set back. And so here I can again use tab completion and uh, I'm opening this file and I'm telling pandas to load uh, the data set in the hits group. Uh, so if I now have a look at this hits, you can see that we now have here uh, 2361 hits, which are um, coming from different DOMs. Uh, so these are digital optical modules and these optical modules have different PMT IDs, 31 of each. Um, and um, there is a time of the of the hit where the where the photoelectron hit uh, the cathode, um, and um, there's a, this uh, TOT and the trigger mask, uh, which is not so important right now. Um, okay, so let's have a quick look at the at the TOT distribution. This is basically the signal you get from the PNT. So whenever this this photon hits the the cathode and then gen and uh, creates this photoelectron. Um, um, you will have this drop in the in the voltage, and uh, the time um, the voltage drops under a given threshold, which is uh, pre-calibrated in our case to a, a certain value, um, you uh, get this uh, response uh, from the system. So in this case, these are nanoseconds, and most of the, of the time you have something like 26 nanoseconds for a single photoelectron hit. Uh, Okay, now um, I would like to group them by DOM ID. So um, I create uh, a new variable uh, called hits by DOM ID and, uh, and group them uh, by DOM ID, as I said. Um, group by, like this. And um, so let me quickly print it. So if I hint, uh, if I print uh, DOM ID and the DOM hits, um, in hits by DOM ID. So this is the method you can uh, use to quickly iterate through the stuff. Um, I print the DOM IDs and I print the DOM hits so that, that you know what, what I'm talking about. So here's our DOM ID. And here on this DOM, we have uh, um, um, these hits. On the next, uh, next DOM, we have these hits and, and so on. So have multiple DOMs in this data set, it's, it's quite large. Uh, of course, nothing compared to real data where we have uh, hundreds of millions of hits, um, but uh, it's a small sample to work with. And I can um, um, use this get group to get uh, the hits on a, on a specific DOM. And you can see that here 
and there are hits on different PMTs on this DOM. So this is only unique per uh, DOM ID. So we have uh, 31 PMTs uh, in each DOM, but uh, this is not, uh, not a unique number. It's only unique uh, to this specific DOM ID always. Um, and um, what I would like to do here is to do this double sorting, which I was uh, talking about. So for example, if I'm interested in the very first hit uh, on each DOM, then I can use um, the hits table, um, sort values uh, method, and then group by the DOM ID and by time. So it will first group by DOM ID and then uh, group by time. Um, uh, I, sorry, I, it was it was sorted by DOM ID and then by time, and then do this group by uh, DOM ID. And the first uh, aggregation method or method it will give me just the first one. So what I end up with is, uh, is just a table uh, which contains a single entry for each DOM with the hit, uh, which was the very first according to these uh, sorting uh, mechanism. Um, this is very, very nice if you want to have, uh, uh, for example, the time of the very first hit uh, on each DOM, or, or if you want to, to look at the, the very first uh, trigger mask or, or uh, whatever. Um, and to take it to another level, um, hits by DOM ID. Um, I think I already have this. Um, so this is our group by object. Um, now let's uh, do a fancy plot where we visualize the, the TOT distribution for each DOM. So what I do now is I first create my um, subplots with matplotlib. We will discover this later. So sorry if it's now a bit too confusing, uh, but you have to trust me. Um, I create uh, six rows and, uh, and three columns and uh, I specify figure size so that it doesn't blow up my screen. Um, I want to share the X coordinates and share the Y coordinates like this. And I would like to also define a common histogram style. This, uh, um, let's make it a bit prettier. Um, so what I, I often do when I, when I pass around options to plotting uh, things, etc., is to um, create one dictionary, which I can reuse so that I don't have to type in everything all the time. Um, so his type in this case, I think, I think step should be nice and line width. Uh, should be two. So this is just now, uh, this creates now this Python dictionary. And now I can iterate through these X's and uh, through the gr uh, groups. And uh, let's call this hits, otherwise we overwrite it. Um, I now zip together the X's of these uh, subplots. So now I, I, I was creating the subplots, uh, but again, I will explain it to you in a few minutes in the next session. Um, and I pass in these uh, hits uh, by DOM ID. And here I can now create um, my histogram for each DOM. So inside this, this for loop, every time it iterates, I will have um, the DOM, which is my DOM ID. Oh, let's call it DOM ID then. And the hits which are corresponding to it. So in each iteration, I really only deal with, with one single DOM. And uh, everything else, all the magic here above will make sure that uh, it will land in the right uh, um, plot in the, in the very end. So I use the tot. Um, and I create this histogram. Uh, let's also add the label to it, like DOM, DOM ID. And um, yeah, mm, hist style. So now I'm passing my histogram style to it so that I, uh, yeah, actually in this case, I could have also written it right here, but now it's a bit more uh, proper. I would like to activate the legend and set my X label to, um, TOT, which is in nanoseconds, which we call this TOT, which is nice. So let's hit, let's see how many times I uh, messed up the typing. Uh, step not defined, his type, uh, of course. Let's uh, put it in uh, quotes. Let's try again. Oh, only one typo. Okay, that's nice. All right. So this is how it looks like. Um, now it created uh, these elements. There is a, uh, some things to, <laughs> To clean up because you can see the X labels are are hidden. You most likely don't want them either on on all of them, only on the bottom ones. So you can here do some magic uh, to check if you are at the bottom um, of the of your uh, plot. But uh, yeah, this is how you would do these uh, group by aggregations. Okay, I think. This should be it. I would not like to overcomplicate it. There are a few other exercises with solutions and uh, some explanations. Um, I think we can go over to the questions. Um, and uh, yeah.
thank you for your attention. Um, Thanks, Tom. Um, very nice. And yeah, we have a few minutes for question. Um, I think there there were a lot of uh, questions around data formats, basically. So, as a more general question, can you maybe explain the difference between I don't know an Excel file, a CSV file, a, a GFF file that you use, and and what you would recommend to use? Ah, okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so it it all boils down to the way the data is is represented on your on your hard drive. So there are so-called ASCII formats, which are just storing text files, and there are binary formats, which are storing binary data, which needs to be uh, well, which is not really readable for, by humans. So this means um, if you look at this uh, this file here, this is now a text format. Uh, of course, it's a CSV file. And all the data is uh, written as, uh, so each character is basically a byte. Uh, you can see it like this. So you can really just uh, check the size of this. Uh, so if I do an LSAL uh, neutrinos, you can see that this, this is the number of bytes you need to store. Um, but uh, many times um, this, um, let me open the file again. Uh, for example, if you look at this value here, it's uh, 2.34, blah, 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 blah. So if you count the bytes, you see that it's 1.1234567891011. Uh, blah, 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 blah. So it's like uh, 15 or 16 bytes needed to store this value as an ASCII format. And this is not very uh, efficient um, because uh, you already know that you have these uh, float64, for example. Uh, which has eight bytes and it can store uh, almost the same pre precision. So maybe you don't even need these uh, very uh, uh, last positions. Uh, so you can use a more compact structure to, to represent your data. Um, the other thing is uh, if you use these binary representations, um, you can easily also um, implement a compress compression algorithms into your, into your binary format. So for example, HD5 in, in, uh, implements a lot of them. And of course, uh, all kinds of binary format representations have some kind of uh, compression format. So since the data is anyways not really human readable, uh, uh, it's compressed uh, away and uh, you can choose the compression met method based on how you deal with the data and uh, gain a lot of uh, benefits. So for example, if you only have a lot of zeros and ones because one column contains only zeros and ones, uh, then um, um, some compression algorithms might uh, might have a compression ratio of one to 100 or, or even more um, when there are some uh, structures uh, inside it. So uh, this can be helpful. So most of the, of the time, ASCII is not the way to go. Um, and the precision is, is uh, arbitrary and, uh, and uh, the way to handle it is, is not really nice. I mean, for human readability is okay, but if you, if you learn the tools, how to open data and read binary formats, uh, those are the preferred ones. Um, you can also uh, gzip a file. So if I do this gzip neutrino CSV, you can see that I now shrink the, I shrink the size. So before we have um, we have uh, the size was around uh, eight kilobytes. Now it's uh, it's only three kilobytes. But I think this uh, whole data set I have this here um, it contains um, like. Uh, uh, 600,000 items, so you can calculate it by, by yourself. If you have 6,000 items and uh, float 64 representations, uh, then you get uh, the minimum amount of uh, things you need to store it in a raw format. So HD5 is a good format. Uh, there are also other formats like FITS and, and um, other binary formats, which, uh, which have all kinds of, of features to make your, your data more uh, structured also. The other um, thing is, um, um, ASCII formats tend to, oh, now I have to unzip it, <laughs> sorry. Um, ASCII formats um, usually are only suited for, for 2D arrays uh, because it's really hard to, to represent here multi-dimensional multi uh, things. You can use JSON or Bison or, or other uh, formats which, which allow uh, nested data, but then the parsing is always, uh, it always has to, has to go through all the stuff. So, as you have seen at the very beginning where we use this read um, CSV function, it, uh, it needs to interpret basically every single byte and it needs to run over and do comparison and see if this is the next character, is this a column or is this a comma, is this the next data set, is this a new line, et cetera, et cetera. For binary formats, the parser is much more deterministic because you can, for example, store how many um, um, values are coming and this is one single number and then read it. So, um, 
um, I actually use, uh, um, yeah, I, I analyze a lot of uh, binary. I don't have any nice examples where, where you, you can see it right now, but um, yeah. So anyways, if it's deterministic, it's easier to parse. So I think that was a very, very long answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> very complete answer. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, maybe a, a short, quick question that we had and that related to um, your lecture from this morning. Can we use Numba with Panda? Oh, that's uh, a good question. <laughs> Specifically with, with the apply function from Panda. Um, yes. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. I thought I will have time to cover this. Uh, let me scroll through the... Uh, exercises. So actually, uh, you can use so these aggregation functions, which I which I showed to you, where you can also pass in your own functions. Uh, actually, supports whatever you throw it in. So if it's a number uh, function, it uh, it will work. Uh, let me search for number here. Um, yeah, here I had an example which I unfortunately could not do. Um, let me see what kind of example this was. Okay, so here you can see um, in this line, um, I used a, a slow function, which I wrote in Python. So it's not even number uh, jitted. Uh, it uses uh, some uh, Python functions and length to calculate the mean. So it's basically a very slow implementation of mean. And then I did this group by operation um, and then the aggregation. Uh, and I passed in my, my own function, which is completely allowed. Uh, and uh, if I don't, uh, um, do anything, uh, then I get, uh, like in this case, 100 milliseconds for runtime. Uh, and then I have to make a small uh, adjustment because uh, the, um, if I choose the engine number, which is supported by, by this aggregation thing, uh, there are, you have to adjust the, the, the signature of your function a little bit. So it's still the very same code, but I, it has to accept two values instead. And uh, you can see that I'm calling the very same group by function, aggregate with my uh, slow uh, mean function, which is still not number jitted. And if I specify as an engine, the number engine, um, pandas will throw this function into a JIT compiler of number, compile it for you, and then execute it. And in this case, it really gave uh, me a, a gain of, uh, of four times uh, speed. So yes, you can. Um, you can even use uh, Cyton. So sometimes if you don't have number in your system installed, you can also you choose the Cyton op option and it will try to compile a, a Cytonized uh, version of your, of your function. Um, in this case, it didn't uh, change anything because uh, it was already as fast as it could get. I hope this answers it. Yes, fantastic. Thanks. Uh, so People can find that in the notebook exercise and you will also post the solution one mm -hmm. later. So yeah, we encourage people to go through uh, the exercises later yep. on. The Absolutely. Time. I try to, to make every single step uh, clear. Uh, I hope it's, but as always, just uh, ask your questions if, if you encounter anything. And uh, yeah. Great, cool. thank you. So- no, and I think we will uh, um, have a short break now. We have the MatPlotLib session after, but uh, yeah, let's let's take a five minute break and and we come back. All right. Thanks. Thank you.